<clears throat> hey y'all welcome um we're gonna give just a minute or two for people to join um do we have a few more people in the waiting room And so you can probably see we have some interpretation options for you tonight. And so um, in just a minute, we'll have a statement um, and sharing about language justice um, for this workshop. But before we do that, I wanted to thank our sponsors um, for the session today. We had so much support from so many different amazing groups at Tulane. Um, and so for one, I just wanted to lift up the Newcomb Art Museum. Um, for being the title sponsor of this. And I also wanted to shout out the TIDES First Year Experience Program. And I also wanted to shout out the Bywater Institute and the Tulane Department of Environmental Science, Envi Ecology and Environmental Biology, so many sponsors. We're gonna put them all uh, at the end of this video, give them a, an official shout out, but I just wanted to lift up some of those names. Uh, first and foremost. So without further ado, um, we would love to hear from our interpreters about language justice before we kick off the panel. Hola, mi nombre es María Luisa, mi pronombre es ella. Estoy aquí hoy con mi compa y cointérprete Carla, sus pronombres son ella y ella. Somos miembros del colectivo de justicia del lenguaje Bancha Lenguas, basado en Bulbancha, Luisiana. Hoy estamos proveyendo interpretación simultánea del inglés al español como parte de nuestro esfuerzo por crear espacios multilingües. Acompañándonos hoy está Denise Crochet, quien está proveyendo interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano. Hi, my name is María Luisa. My pronouns are she and her. I'm joined today by my comrade and co-interpreter Carla, whose pronouns are she, her, they, them. We are members of the Bancha Lenguas Language Justice Collective based in Bulbancha, Louisiana. Today, we'll be providing simultaneous interpretation from English to Spanish as part of our effort to create multilingual spaces. With us today is Denise Crochet, who will be providing ASL interpretation. Bulbancha is la palabra chocta que significa la tierra donde se hablan muchos lenguajes. Bulbancha is the Choctaw word, which means the land where many languages are spoken. En Bancha Lenguas, nos esforzamos en crear un espacio para que todos aquí presentes puedan entender y ser entendidos en el idioma en que nos sentimos más poderosos. At Bancha Lenguas, we strive to create space for everyone here to understand and be understood in the language in which we feel most powerful. Notará que estamos usando la letra E al final de las palabras binarias. Esto no es un error. Es nuestro intento de crear un lenguaje más inclusivo e incluir personas de todos los géneros. You will notice us using the letter E at the end of gendered words in Spanish. It's not an error. It's us attempting to create a more inclusive language and include people of all genders. To access the interpretation platform, if you're using a computer, you will find a globe icon at the bottom of your screen with the word interpretation. Click on it and select the, the channel with the language of your choice. For smartphone or tablet, look for three dots that read more and click on that to make your selection. When making your selection, you will see the option to mute original audio to hear only the voice of the interpreter. To hear the original audio, you may leave it unmuted and you can change that selection at any time. And lastly, don't suffer in silence. If you have any problems with hearing us or the speakers, please send us a message in the chat. Para acceder a la plataforma de interpretación, si están usando una computadora, van a ver un icono de globo al pie de la pantalla con la palabra interpretación. Haz clic sobre él y selecciona el canal de tu lenguaje preferido. Para teléfono inteligente o tableta, busca tres puntos que leen más. Haz clic para hacer su selección. Al elegir tu idioma, verás la opción para silenciar el audio original. Haz clic en ella para escuchar solo la voz del intérprete. Para escuchar el audio original, puedes dejarlo en silencio. Sin silenciar, perdón. 
puedes cambiar tu selección en cualquier momento. Y por último, no sufras en silencio. Si tienes cualquier problema escuchándonos a nosotros o a los presentadores, por favor envíe un mensaje al chat. Thank you for the commitment to create a multilingual space with us. Gracias por el compromiso a crear un espacio multilingüe con nosotros. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just gonna kick it off. Uh, my name is Benji, I use they, them pronouns. I work at the Tulane Center for Public Service. And uh, these are my friends and comrades who are uh, on this panel tonight. And, um, you know, some we were talking earlier, sometimes panels can feel like we're um, putting people on the spot to have to like be the experts of some really big topic. And I wanna be really clear, there is so much expertise on this panel. Um, and I also wanna just kind of put everyone at ease that we're really just having a conversation tonight, right? About disability justice in the wake of Hurricane Ida and what the implications are, right? For, for future hurricanes um, and for future disasters um, across the country and around the world. So um, partly I say that for myself because I get nervous and I also wanna take some of the pressure off of these amazing panelists as well. Um, there's a lot to be said on this topic and so Without further, uh, without any further ado, I want to um, pass the mic and let our panelists introduce themselves. So, um, Ricky, if you want to introduce yourself first, um, and then we can go to Ashley, and we can go to Ashana and Jossie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ricky Ainey, and I am co-owner of Annie Bullion Consulting Company. Um, I have been a disability rights advocate for going on 12 years now, and I am happy to be here. Oh, also a native of New Orleans. Thanks so much. Ashley, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're uh, on mute. Muted. Classic Zoom. I know. You think I would know how to do this by now? Um, but let me start over. I am Ashley Volion. I wear many different hats. I am co-owner of Annie Volion Consulting. I also teach at Tulane. I teach um, sociology of the family. And I am a policy analyst. I almost said that wrong with my old title, but I'm the policy analyst at Disability Rights Louisiana. And I am originally from Lafitte, Louisiana, but I currently live in New Orleans. Thanks so much. Um, Ashana, you wanna go next? Hi, I'm Ashana Bigard. Um, I'm a native New Orleanian. I have been doing advocacy and organizing around disability justice in the education system and housing systems for about 15 years um, because of my own um, my my own and my own children's disabilities but also it's, it's the work I do in education justice and about 70 percent of it is definitely disability justice because of who is most marginalized kicked out disciplined um, and not even included or let in Thanks so much, Ashana. Jossie, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, God. Let me. You're great, Jossie. We can hear you okay. So one thing just to name is that there are still some connectivity issues in many parts of Louisiana uh, due to the hurricane. So. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Oh, thank gosh. Hi, my name is Jocelyn. I go by Jossie at, at Jossie the Jaguars, creator and speaker on social media. Um, I am known a lot for, for ranting on Twitter and it kind of going a little bit too big than I wanted to. Um, and I am a lot on Instagram. I do a lot of activism around uh, spreading awareness on ableism and disability and the intersections. And um, I start hashtags. I create a platform so disabled people can come together and share their experiences 
with their intersectionality. And um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Jassy. Um, so I guess just to open it up, we wanted to um, give our panelists a chance to talk about, um, you know, if you feel comfortable sharing to whatever extent, what was your experience of dealing with Hurricane Ida, um, either as a person with disabilities or somebody who works in disability advocacy and organizing? Um, what are some of the things that you saw happening or not happening that should have been? Um, I can go first. I uh, I definitely was was not prepared to leave, not mentally. I was not prepared mentally to leave, but I knew that I had to get out because I can't swim and I didn't know if we were going to be flooded or not. So I left with my family and it was extremely stressful because I don't live with my family. I live on my own and I ended up being a financial care person, so to speak. I'm trying to calm everyone else down because I have family members who are dealing with mental health disabilities that they will not acknowledge. Um, a lot of arguing and yelling over simple stuff that I was not used to, which raised my uh, anxiety to a level that I didn't even think that it could get to. I found myself drinking wine every single night just to calm myself for a bit. Sorry if that's too much, but it's the reality of it. Um, and just worried about what I was going to come home to and still working in the disability community at Families Helping Families NOLA and just being a person with a disability, worried about everyone else who was disabled, who was not able to get out. Um, that was a major concern and seeing things like 311 not working properly and people not having food. And it's just the whole lot of it was just, it was a lot. <laughs> And I can go next. So um, I actually decided to stay. I stayed with a friend in Metairie. So I didn't stay in my own home in New Orleans, but I stayed in Metairie. Um, and it was the worst hurricane that I've ever seen in my life. Um, and the scary part was that I am from Lafitte, Louisiana, and my family are still down there. And they had to get rescued by boat the next day after the hurricane. But just not having the capacity to do anything for them and my sister was sending me videos throughout the whole thing. And, and then I have a friend, a really good friend that lives in Laplace. So I was hearing that at the same time that people were in their attics and not being able to get a hold of people. Luckily, my sister and I shared our location the whole time. And we were able to talk to each other throughout the whole thing. But this was the first hurricane that my family said from now on that they're gonna evacuate no matter if it's a hurricane one, a tropical storm, they're just gonna evacuate. And my family has never said that in their life. Um, they are by you people and by you people don't leave. They stay with their community and they're usually okay. Hurricanes growing up were a really community building thing where people would just unload all their refrigerators and cook all their food and just come together as a community and, you know, let the water go down and that was that. But this one was something out of the movies, I want to say. And I will never stay anymore because even though I had food and water and everything that I needed because of my friends, my staff members had to evacuate. So I was depending on friends. Um, and 
and one staff member actually because i did have one staff member but that's a lot on one person and the, i've learned that so now i really want to start um a mutual aid like attendant group for hurricanes because i think that is needed um more attendant care during these crises because people have to take care of their own families and also due to all the heat from the lights being off and everything um my feet swole up for over a week and i wasn't able to put on shoes um but i was lucky in that my apartment didn't get any damage and we didn't even flood down my street but just having like i said before it was the scariest thing that i've ever been through in my life just being away from my family not knowing if they were safe and watching the videos throughout the whole thing and just being helpless um and that's what really hurt me during the time and you know this also and i know i'm going all over the place but the city wasn't even prepared for this either and us in New Orleans, we did really well um, considering. And just to know that even though we did well, they couldn't even handle what we did have. And so that's scary. And that's scary for people with disabilities too. Like Ricky said, 311 was down at one point, 911 was even down at another point at the same time actually and so it was just really scary and but there are hurricanes that also teaches you who's there for you and what community you do have and so I was really blessed for all of that thanks so much Ashley um Jossie, uh, do you want to share next? And I know your internet's uh, cutting in and out a little bit, but we were just asking if you wanted to share anything about your experience during the storm. To me, I'm sorry, I broke up. Yes, yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry, y'all. So um, my experience at the store, um, well, I specifically remember that the week before, uh, when we heard about it the first time, like no one, because I'm from Cutoff, Louisiana. I remember, and usually I'm very precautious about storms, but I remember I wasn't too, um, no one thought it was going to get this bad. No one thought it was going to be this bad. Um, and it wasn't until like Wednesday night, no, not even Thursday for, uh, for most people down the bayou, like towards Grand Island all that, uh, we started to see that it was going to be bad. <laughs> and, um, my family and I, well, my mom and I, we decided to um, evacuate Thursday evening and um, no we just we, yeah we decided to evacuate Thursday evening and by Friday morning we left and during that time uh, I was the one that was keeping my whole family in contact um, because I think my phone at the time was the one with the best signal um, and I was also keeping everyone on social media contact uh like up to date on what was going on with me and um by sunday i remember when the hurricane hit no one knew there was there wasn't any coverage down the bayou going south like past homa so no one really knew what was going on with their homes or with their communities um 
And the way we found out about my house um, was through a YouTube video. And it was only for seven seconds where we could see that the house had received like significant damage. And um, yeah, so. Uh, we really struggled in, in that we, my mom, my mom, and I'm sorry. Sorry, y'all. It's a little bit hard. Hard. Um, um, we really struggled in that my mom and I were like trying to figure out who's gonna take care of me, um, who's gonna go check up on the house. Thankfully, my sisters were there for me and were able to like both take care of of me while my, my mom went back home um, to cut off to remember like we could barely like talk to her or anything because we just couldn't see it, the signal is just so bad and so as y'all can tell um there's an internet connectivity issue still down in Homa, right? This is happening. It's been, uh, it's been weeks. It's been almost two months. And there's still um, so thinking about, especially being in community, getting resources through online and just communication, just all of the, the challenges. Um, so we'll check back in um, with Jossie. And, uh, and I'm so don't be sorry. Um, it's, it's, you know, and I'm sorry that we don't have uh, more ability to create access in that way. Um, I want to, I, I do want to invite Ashana, if you want to share kind of what was your experience of the storm, and especially thinking about through education justice lens. Um, I mean, I well, know you, my, go ahead. Well, my experience of the storm was actually, um pretty weird because right before the storm happened i mean i'm watching the news and everything and i'm waiting for the mayor to issue a mandatory evacuation and of course the reason i'm waiting for it is, is because we know how many people we have in poverty we know how many disabled citizens and how many senior citizens we have that we know do not have transportation to evacuate themselves from this city right we know about the number of people with asthma on um cpap machines at night who take breathing treatments every day. They had already anticipated the lights would be out for anywhere from three to six weeks. So I'm waiting for the mandatory evacuation. And of course my pressure is going up. And then of course, and this is something I acknowledged afterwards, my PTSD was kicking in because of Hurricane Katrina, you know, because it's happening on the anniversary and it feels like the exact same thing that we went through all of this and there's no preparing in place. And like, like, I mean, all of us who do activist work, I feel like our collective blood pressure was just, you know, cause you're waiting <laughs> and it, it, it doesn't happen. And my son is watching a television concert. I have a 10 year old on the autism spectrum. He's highly functioning, but he's watching it 24 seven. He doesn't want it to be changed. And his, his anxiety was through the roof. So I, and at first I was like, I was not gonna leave. I kept convincing because the truth was I couldn't afford to leave, right? And the way I would have to leave, I would have to take my mom, my sister, my niece, my nephew. And then finally, I was just convinced. And I had friends who supported me, been supporting me and getting me to support and connections that allowed me to leave. And at first I left with my son because we only have one car. Well, we actually had, we had two cars, but my car is in bad shape. It's a hoopty. It's an unkept hoopty. Well, was an unkept hoopty. <laughs> Long story short, 
I decided to take my son out because my son was absolutely having conniption fits. He was scared as hell. He's really an empath. So I kept telling him it wasn't going to be bad. He kept yelling in my face. It was. Um, we left the day of. We had to come back two days later to get my sister and my mom. And so we pulled them in my hoopty. And of course, my car broke down before we got to Texas, totally tore to pieces. While all this is happening, I have people from my community calling and right before saying things like they need to people who could evacuate and then people who could evacuate were scared to because everybody's PTSD was acting up. And for teenagers with PTSD, especially mothers of black children, with P, they didn't want to bring them anywhere because people are not going to understand why they're freaking out at loud noises or anything else. And the experience with Hurricane Katrina, even though a lot of these children weren't born, their parents had experiences, which made them feel like their children's disabilities would be criminalized. And just the asking for help, where is the, we know all this is gonna happen because it's happened before. Even if this storm is not what you think it's gonna be, we should already be laying out counseling service, services to deal with PTSD, services to deal with all these different things. And a mandatory evacuation is just necessary, again, because where we are on poverty, asthma, disabilities, and we know most of these people cannot transport themselves out of this situation. And they cannot sit in a house with no lights for four to six weeks. How are they gonna even plug up their phones to call anybody if they need help, if those people are accessible? I, it, and so my frustration level, <laughs> I just, yeah, and so, I am still frustrated because the services that should have been there are still not there. I mean, they literally children went back to school to business as usual and nobody's dealing with the fact that kids lost their homes, that they, people actually lost loved ones, that everybody's anxiety was not dealt with. And of course our children, it's in the back of their minds. If this happens again, we're not gonna have any help again. Cause no one has even come out to make assurances that if this ever happens again, this and this and this and this is what we're gonna do and this is the plan. And um, yeah, so like definitely still people still not getting what they need. People still have tarps on their houses, people's roofs still leaking, people with living in houses with mold and getting those phone calls and um, all schools be to be expecting children to act like it's business as usual and parents and um, it's not. And yeah, that's pretty much my experience. So I'm like, I'm a downer. I'm sorry. Uh. Thank you so much, Ashana. And thank, thank all of y'all just for your vulnerability. I know it's a lot to ask y'all to share. You know, these experiences are still so fresh for so many people. Um, and so, you know, maybe like on the, in terms of kind of like what we can learn from this, because um, it's like the hurricane, it's, there's the preparation and then it's, surviving the storm and then it's after the storm and recovering and there's you know really important issues that need to be addressed that haven't been addressed um and so i, I don't know maybe um ricky if you wanted to talk a little bit about preparation right um so whether through your personal lens or just thinking about what are what are some of the things that worked for you in preparing for the storm and what are some things that you think might need to be in place um moving forward in terms of accessibility and disability justice um, preparing for hurricanes? For myself, I know how to prepare, you know, to have several days of medication, clothing, all of the basic stuff. But if I am a person who cannot get out on their own, the city of New Orleans is not prepared in any capacity to take care of its disabled, elderly, and other needs, communities. We are left behind. I have been part of a documentary. I can't think of the name of it. I never can right now. Um, but anyway, it, it was on hurricane preparedness and we're just overlooked. As I was in the hotel with my mom who was having a breakdown, as my stepdad was having a breakdown, as my sister slammed the hotel door and left out, I'm getting emails of people who need help, people who need food, people who don't know what to do, people who don't know which shelter to go to. My other friends who work in the disability community, they're worn out because if they are at a shelter, they're worried about their own pets, their own homes, things of that nature. I don't know where to begin to get our communities 
to be seen and to be regarded as important as other communities and other races, to be quite honest. Um, it, it is just a horrible place to be in when you don't know what to do, where your resources are gonna come from. Luckily, I'm a person that saves. Luckily, I'm a person who has such high anxiety that I prepare for pretty much everything. But that is not the case for everyone. And even with all of the preparing that I did, I was not prepared for the experiences that I had. I didn't have a lick of damage to my house. I turned around maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, my refrigerator is leaking from the inside. I don't know what, where that's coming from. I can't afford to get a refrigerator. So I have to wipe up the water uh, that's leaking to the floor and hopefully I won't slip on it because I can't afford to do so. I didn't think I had any issues. Um, I, I don't know who to talk to about that. I applied for FEMA. They said they were gonna give me $230 and like $30 for um, miscellaneous items and that's not gonna buy a refrigerator. So, <laughs> you know, it's that, but we're just not prepared to take care of the citizens that live here. And it's a shame because we've gone through Katrina. You think that we would have learned some pivotal lessons, but unfortunately we haven't. Thanks so much. I'm going to um, pass it to Ashley. What um, what are some of the things that you did to prepare and, and what are some things that you think worked um, for the system and what maybe what are some things that are missing? Well, for preparing for the hurricane, I know for next time I definitely need to prepare more. Um, I thought I had a plan together, but that kind of fell through. And like I said in my introduction, I was kind of at the mercy of my friends and one of my staff members um, because I usually have three um, that come in and out every day, but I was down to two because, um, because they had to evacuate as well. So for, for the next one, like Ricky said, the city is not prepared to take care of us or anyone for that matter. So I am starting to save up the little bit that I can. Um, luckily I have the means to do so, but it does worry, worry me for people in general that don't have the means to evacuate. Because if I'm completely honest, that was one of the reasons why I didn't evacuate was because I had maybe a hundred dollars to my name at that point. Um I was gonna get paid two days later, but that doesn't help right in the at the moment. And so I didn't really have the means. Like I said earlier, my family are not the family to evacuate. So I couldn't go to Lafitte because a power wheelchair in water is not a good situation. And we didn't get hit by Katrina back in 2005, but we got hit by Rita and not many people realize that. So I lost a wheelchair already in the hurricane. So after my, after the second of my staff members left, my friend had to leave with her kids after three or four days because we didn't expect it to be this bad. We expected me to be by her house for two days and the lights will come on and, you know, we'll go back to living life like it normally is, but that did not happen. So then I had to go by another friend's house um, when she left and my friend told me, she was like, well, you should call your family or go by your family. And I was like, at this moment, I can't. They they are underwater. Luckily, they're built up enough where they didn't lose everything in their house. But they lost, my father lost his business. Um, he, oh, he owned, 
I don't know whether to say owns or owned because he lost everything in it. Um, he does plan to come back, but that's going to take a while um, to do so. So they didn't have the means of, after I decided I wasn't going to go there, they couldn't come get me. Um, and like I said, well, I didn't say, so the water on the day of the hurricane kept coming up. And they they live, their house is elevated. It's on top of a mound. So it's about, I want to say, nine or 10 feet off the ground. And so the water never even came that close, but it came two steps from getting into the house. And my sister was texting me this. And there was nothing I could do. So I know I went off on a tangent, but what what I would do better next time is just preparing to have other options that are away from the city. And so now I'm starting to save a little bit here and there. And next year I'll be prepared, but it does scare me for for those that can't do so. Thank you so much, Ashley. Right, so even just like thinking about the complexity of planning for yourself, but also your, your family, your relations, what that looks like, mm -hmm. who can afford to save, like all these things. Um, so Jossie, I'm so glad you're back. Um, we were talking about kind of like what what you were thinking about or doing as you were preparing for the storm and maybe what lessons have been learned, um, like what maybe what things need to be in place uh, for folks living with disabilities. And um, yeah, so if there's anything that that you wanted to share. So um, I don't know if y'all were able to hear, but nobody um, towards Grand Isle where like we live in Cuddle, which is kind of close to Grand Isle. Nobody thought it was going to be bad, not even up until like Thursday. Um, but Thursday night, I remember my family and I got super, super anxious, my mom and I, that we decided to evacuate. Um, so Friday, my mom and uh, my mom and her boyfriend, they were getting the house ready, boarding up windows, getting um, furniture like on the floor so it doesn't get knocked down. And I was the one who did like all the shelter and, the, and booking hotels and things like that. I was also the one that was keeping communication with all of my family members who live down South. And um, <laughs> I, let me just say booking, it was so hard booking a hotel because pretty much every time I kept clicking on a hotel, it would be booked right away. We could not find a hotel all the way up probably up until like Houston, the Houston area. And that was on Thursday. No, that was on Friday. And um, by the time I finally was able to click on a hotel, I forgot to mention wheelchair accessible. Uh, Cause you're so focused on just getting a room, just getting a hotel that you didn't, that didn't think of that. So what I ended up doing was adding in the special request area for the hotel that I needed a wheelchair accessible room downstairs with a um, shower. And um, when we got there on Saturday, we drove down the whole day Friday. And when we got there on Saturday, um, the room was upstairs and they had to like completely change everything for um, the room that they put us in was upstairs and they had to move in another person from downstairs to up so I can get like at least in the room the room wasn't accessible at all no shower um I couldn't get on the bed and uh it was just very unpleasant because I mean yeah we were in shelter and all that stuff but not being able to take care of me the way I'm used to doing so um and having my mom help me with everything like we're already going through a hurricane crisis, worrying about our families. Then on top of that, worrying about my caregiving. Um, and it's not that, you know, 
having assistance isn't bad, but when you're going through a crisis like this and the person who helps you is going through the crisis as well, that's just a huge stressor. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna call it ableist because the whole situation just had multiple stressors and coming from like South Louisiana, don't feel like anyone is like is watching out for you. Um, I wasn't, when I booked the hotel, I wasn't thinking about a personal care assistance. I was thinking about just getting out. And um, yeah, I, I didn't get to mention, but um, our house was deemed unlivable and I lost a family member. Uh, right now we don't have anything like covering our roof because the roof is gone. So every time it rains, it's getting in there. And um, that's my experience with Hurricane Ida and housing and all that stuff. Thank you so much, Jossie. Oh, um, Ashana, I wanted to I wanted to ask you too, because I know we talked right before the storm came, right? And we were thinking of we were talking about um, the experience of Katrina and the impacts on um, you know, PTSD and, and what that means, how, how people cope with that, even whether to stay or leave, right? Um, so what was that like for you as you were thinking about leaving? Okay. Um, so for me, it was, it was this, it was a like, um, so a lot of times, um, because I'm really not a, because I don't feel like I live in a world which allows me to be fat, black, and disabled. I don't, I don't acknowledge I have PTSD, severe dyslexia, and depression disorder. Cause it's, it's a lot of it is just too much. Like you, you can, like, if you go into a job interview, I'm already going in there with two check marks again. Me, well, actually three, I'm fat, black, and Southern. <laughs> so then I have three more added to it is just too much and so a lot of times I live in denial but as um, my son was watching the screen I was watching it and it's just the day's coincidence you know like it's the end of the month like it was like you have no money you have a little credit but you know good and well you're not going to get paid back because it's not, um, you know, mandatory disaster. So they're not gonna, you know, and we went through hurricanes where we spent our money on hotels for ourselves and our families. And when you already don't have money, you go in more debt, it devastates you. Um, so just the anxiety. And then of course, you're already dealing with parents who are already dealing with issues because of COVID. Um, and parents saying, you know, that they wanted a virtual option. Then I had parents calling me, we're about to get this hurricane. If I had a virtual option, we could do virtual school, yada, yada. We should use this, you know, and like, I'm like, but then they were like, the schools weren't passing out any equipment before the hurricane so that if they, you know, if they had to evacuate, they could use the equipment. We already had nobody's 504s, or IEPs being respected or met. You already know, you know, how I go ahead. <laughs> like, it was just insane. And then my son, I see how my son is behaving. And um, and of course my PTSD was in full effect. Like I was like, I wasn't sleeping. I probably didn't sleep for three days, just kind of pacing back and forth, constantly checking my email, constantly hitting people back to tell, you know, sending emails out, texting people in city council who I knew weren't gonna answer me. You know, if they did, we're like, we're doing everything we can you know, trying to keep myself from cursing people out over eating because I'm in full stress PTSD. Like, what the hell are you doing? You know, um, and knowing that I'm not in a rational headspace, you know, checking in with my own self, be like, you're not in a rational headspace. Because I wasn't even tired. I was like manic because I wasn't sleeping, but I also wasn't tired. I couldn't sleep. Um, and then just trying to figure out what the hell was I doing? Um, like, and then how, you know, then of course the self blame comes in. How could you let yourself get back to this situation? You went through Katrina, you know, why are you, you know, you have these children. <laughs> why did you allow yourself to be in this situation to allow this to happen? Why would you be dependent on your politicians? Um, you know, I mean, the, the, that whole situation where you're, you're self-hating, you're going through your issues, you're not dealing with them well, blood pressure medicine not working because you're damn near manic. The medicine that they do give me for anxiety just makes me high. 
I don't feel like it actually deals with it. Um, you know, I was, I was there. I was there for like two weeks, pretty much. Um, and I mean, the good thing is, is that you put me in contact with people, gave me resources. I was able to send resources to people, but still there was a lot of people who were like, okay, you sent me a hundred dollars, but there's no store I can go to to buy. Or this is the last text I'm gonna be able to send you because I'm running out of battery. You know, and it's just like, you're heartbroken because it's like, I can't even check on people. And I feel like I abandoned my people by leaving. And you don't even know how to feel or how to be. Plus, I knew I was in depression. I knew my anxiety was super high. You know, my children's anxiety is super high. You have people who didn't evacuate because of their kids' anxiety and PTSD issues um, because they knew that their children were not going to be manageable. You know, not even manageable. They're not going to be able to get the care or understanding that they need. Like I have a, um, a parent whose son paces, like he will leave the house and just walk around the house. You can't be in use and just walking around as a 16 year old black boy. Like, and those are like the realities you're dealing with. You're like, uh. but at the same time, he can't do it in the city because there's curfews. So it's just like, uh, what do I do? How do I be of help? Um, how do I help myself and my own family? So I was just pretty much in constant, I went between self-deprecation and feeling insane and feeling helpless to rage to back and just the cycle of it. Um, taking CBD oil drops, which weren't doing anything at that point. <laughs> and, you know, maybe taking a half an hour's nap. And then right back to like the phone, the computer, um, and just realizing that wasn't healthy, but still not being able to stop. And then now I'm trying to figure out, well, what can I do differently? And a part of what I'm doing is praying that we get new people in City Hall that we can actually hold accountable. And what does accountability look like, no matter who we have in City Hall to protect our vulnerable citizens? Because I don't make enough money for it to be on me. None of us do on here. If we all put all our money together, everybody on this screen, we still wouldn't have enough money to do what our city is supposed to do. And how do we hold the people in charge accountable and to try to take some of that weight off myself that doesn't and put it on the people it does belong on, which is a process. But like, that's what I'm trying to engage in. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still that way. I still feel like the, uh. Thank you so much, Ashana. Uh, I know that resonated a lot with me and I'm sure uh, with others as well. So we have about 10 minutes left and I wanted to um, kind of like turn to the future and, and kind of going off what Ashana said, like what are the demands that we could be making, um, both of our elected officials, but also what are other ways we can organize within our networks and our communities um, with the resources we do have, right? So. Um, this isn't meant to be to put you on the spot with any immediate answers, but like when you just dream about a future where we always know there's going to be storms, especially with, with climate change, we know this is something we're going to be dealing with, right? So what are some of the things that you would like to see put in place, whether it's the built environment, whether it's the policies we have, um, you know, the resources we have access to, what do you think are some priorities um, or some ideas that you have in mind that you would like to see, um, you know, come into reality? So uh, maybe we could start with you, Ricky. Um, I think the city has a lot of good ideas, but they don't know how to implement them. Um, so we need to have more people with disabilities working in those arenas. Because even for um, Nola Reddy, I asked a question at a meeting one day. I said, hey, do you guys have anyone with a disability working for you? No, not that we know of. Well, how are you going to serve my population? How are you going to know what's important to me? How are you going to know how to help me if you can't? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry, you guys. Um, it, 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 if what I'm going through, it, it doesn't resonate with you. You know, you, you just don't get it. Now, how do we get to that place? Um, I think there does need to be a database of people who want to be put in the database of, hey, this person is disabled, they may need help, so on and so forth. Obviously, everything optional for the person with the disability, but that's something I would like to be signed up for, having reliable transportation to get people out, calling it a mandatory evacuation, knowing that it's going to be a mandatory situation. 
you know, I, I, knowing it's going to be a bad situation. I'm sorry. My anxiety just shot up through the roof. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot. Um, I, I think the main thing is getting persons with disabilities in some of those positions to be able to navigate a lot better than what able-bodied or non-disabled persons are doing. And that's not to criticize because I know that people, a lot of people are doing the best they can. A lot of people take those jobs because they have it in their heart to help the communities, but it's it's not working out because we get left behind over and over and over again. Thanks so much, Ricky. Um, Ashley, how about you? Do you have any thoughts? I know there was a, an idea that you had mentioned um, about accessing care attendants in different areas, and I, I don't want to, anyway, I'll let you speak to that, but. So I'd like to reiterate what Ricky said about getting persons with disabilities in roles um, around the city, especially with NOLA ready and with the whole evacuation preparedness. Um, because if you don't know my needs, then how are you supposed to provide for them? So that that's one, that's a big one. And then also, for people that I would love one day, this is my dream, but I would love to start um, or create a personal care attendant collective for natural disasters. For if, if a person stays behind, they, they would be willing to come in to help a person with a disability. Because like I said, oftentimes attendants have to go with their, their families, right? And take care of themselves. But, but a lot of times, even with the best intentions, not everyone can evacuate. Um, although, you know, it would be great if they all could, um, but that is a big dream of mine to, to short one and honestly when you you brought up that idea for me again um when you were doing all the mutual aid work that you did around the hurricanes and all our texting and just getting resources that was really helpful during the hurricane so that really brought up this idea again or this big dream um but and lastly, I just want people in government positions to be more willing to take things seriously, to call these mandatory evacuations, because like, like the others mentioned, without that designation, we don't get what we need as a community. So those are just some of the ideas. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, Ashana, um, do you want to speak to to that? Anything that you would like to see in place moving forward? And uh, you know, the sky's the limit. I think sometimes. Well, I mean, I have too much stuff. So, but I will say this: um, the number that all of our politicians should have, like the numbers on their wall, the number of children with autism, asthma, cerebral palsy, blind, deaf. You should have the numbers and know who is in your city and who you need to service. So whenever you create any plan, you have to keep all your citizenry in mind. How many undocumented people, just everybody, the amount of poverty, which we have a high rate of poverty, all of that should be in place. If I ask y'all how many people we have with those things, you should know. And if you don't know, definitely like, it has been said already there should be someone, an, a disability advocate at the table because they will get someone with disabilities that doesn't understand the landscape, right? So a disability advocate, a disabled disability advocate needs to be at that table. Someone who has disabilities, but who is also an advocate. And if they can't hire someone full-time, they definitely need to be contracting with the people who are here to contract. We have like what? three or four people here right now that we can, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, who could also help them find someone to fill those spots. So there's just no excuse. 
Um, and I mean, there's just so much. There's just so much. And people are not realizing the genius of people. That's the other thing. I need people to do a deeper dive. Just because someone can't walk, hear, see, speak does not mean that they're not geniuses. And, there are, and we just really need to do more work on looking in what people are geniuses at, what they can do, and investing in it in whole ways and not just talk. Because I see a lot of talk given, but I don't see a lot of action happening. All of the schools should have someone sitting at the table who's a disability advocate who understands disabilities and preferably someone with disabilities that they're contracting with then the same contracting price they pay those other people who don't know the hell they're talking about they can pay them because we have too many children with a number of disabilities going to every single public school and the i i, I could go on for two hours telling y'all about the horror stories that the disabled children and teachers and everybody facing those schools if the teachers get hired if the children get let in you know but a lot of yours already know, and it's just, it's too much. And it's like, it's, what people don't understand is they're compounding traumas onto people who already have traumas, who already have anxiety, who already are not treated fairly. And it's too much. Um, yeah, and it just needs to be accountability. And yeah, and it's, it, I'm telling people, yeah. Hand people the, the, the flavor of the day. I would really rather that we concentrate on equality and what that actually means instead of just using it as a bumper sticker. And it, yeah, that's, yeah, but I won't get into all details. Thanks so much, Ashana. Jossie, um, any, any closing thoughts about what you would like to see in place? As everyone said, adding disabled people to your team, I was a part of the, um, Nickel State University had a crisis management team and I was a part of it along with a blind visually impaired person, a deaf hard hearing person. And we made so many decisions on rescuing, evacuation, preparing stuff. Um, adding disabled people to your team is very important. Um, and just to like give a little bit of prop to us, we're creative AF. <laughs> so we really do know how to figure things out, especially on the spot. We're used to things not being in a we're used to things not being accessible and we know how to make things accessible and adapt to situations really very quickly. Um, things that are important are like food, grocery delivery, prescription pickup, transportation services, offered help around the house. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of once a hurricane, you can't plan for how big a hurricane is going to get because it's, it's sometimes it's unexpected, but you can plan for the general things that you know a storm is going to bring. And planning for those things is very important, including mental health services. Um, and um, yeah, I feel like there's just a lot that y'all can that people can do to step up, including adding disabled people to your team. And I feel like I have one more thing to say. Mm. Oh, so once a hurricane hits, I think we realize that once a hurricane hits, a huge priority is like getting hospitals up, but what that does is it, it accidentally also excludes disabled people who aren't in hospitals, but need the assistance. And we need to prioritize those disabled people as well. And I hope that's thought of as well. And uh, that's, yeah, again, hire us. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here too. I, I piggyback off Jossie when she said she had to find the hotels and everything for her family. I'm, I'm sitting in the car. I was doing the same thing that you were doing, Jossie. I'm texting, I'm emailing. And one more thing before we go, there's also hotels that discriminate as well because I called a lot of them and asked them if they needed, if they took cash or a card. Oh, we only take card. And then when you get there, you see other people paying in cash. It really happened to me. Um, the, the second time we had to uh rebook our room i asked the lady if she took cash she took it from me the second time but she wouldn't take cash from me the first time so that's also an issue but mm. uh, yeah. wow so you just see like there's so many layers right there's so many layers that need to be worked on but you also see there's so much just collective genius even within this little small community right and there's so many more people out there and so if you're one of those people um and you want to continue building please reach out I'm sure this group would love to connect with you. Um, so if you're out there watching um, and we're gonna make this recording available, we hope that we can follow up this conversation with some action. 
um, creating some some more resources or just dreaming together about what um, what a world you know could look like that's that's just and inclusive and accessible. So um, I just want to thank our panelists again. Um, I really want to thank the interpretation team and all of the sponsors. Um, particularly the Newcomb Art Museum uh, for sponsoring this panel. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, so grateful that y'all were able to spend some time with us tonight. And we hope that y'all will stay in touch. Please, uh, I, I shared the donation links um, for our speakers in the chat. Um, so show some financial solidarity if you can, if you have capacity. I know folks are still um, working to recover, right, from the storm. It was a, a huge expense, um, you know, in so many ways. So um, once again, thank you all so much for being here, and I hope y'all have a great rest of your week. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Cassandra.